Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Peter Henry. I'm dean of the Stern School of Business, and it's great to see a full house for this important conversation this afternoon. We pride ourselves here at the Stern School on being a convening place for dialogues like the one we're about to, to have between Mike Spence and, and Matthew Bishop. Tonight's conversation, as I said, is between Matthew Bishop, the US business editor and New York bureau chief for The Economist, and Noble Laureate and NYU Stern professor, Michael Spence. And the conversation really was prompted by the synergy between two publications that I just so happen to have here with me on stage. <laughs> the first publication uh, is called The Quest for Jobs and the Future of Work, and it appeared in last month's issue of The Economist. And the second publication is uh, Mike Spence's recently published book, The Next Convergence, The Future of Economic Growth in a Multi-Speed World. Just a little bit about our two conversationalists uh, here this evening. Uh, in addition to his role as editor and bureau chief and author of this report, Matthew Bishop has written reports on emerging economies and firms, as well as the state of philanthropy, a report that was expanded into his uh, well-received book, Philanthrocapitalism. He has a new book, in addition, called The Road from Ruin, How to Renew Capitalism and Put America Back on Top, published earlier this year with Michael Green. So please welcome Matthew Bishop. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Michael Spence, as I said, is a Nobel Laureate. And I should add our, one of our three Nobel Laureates here at Stern. We just received our third Nobel Laureate this week, Tom Sargent, uh, and a professor of economics here in the Stern School, currently teaching a course on emerging markets. His research focuses on economic policy and emerging markets, the economics of information, and the impact of leadership on economic growth. There are many things I could tell you about Mike, but most recently from 2006 to 2010, he was chairman of the Independent Commission on Growth and Development, a global policy group that focuses on strategies for producing rapid and sustainable growth and reducing poverty. So I'm about to turn it over to our two conversationalists. Just a word about the format. Uh, first, we'll hear uh, Matthew and, and Mike uh, discuss the outlook for jobs and the future of work. And then uh, we will open it up for, for Q&A. And I myself, uh, as, much, as important as what these two gentlemen have to say here on, on stage this evening, my wife is giving a speech tonight, and everything that she has to say is, is, is in my world a little, a little, just a little bit more important this evening. So I will be exiting, but I leave you in wonderful hands. Uh, enjoy the conversation, uh, a very important conversation. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, so this is Matthew and I'm Mike. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. We actually were on NPR uh, earlier today discussing some of these issues. Um, Matthew has written a really comprehensive, terrific report on the employment challenges. And so I thought the way we would organize this is I'll say a few words about where I came from, you know, starting with the emerging economy growth and their growing size and impact on the global economy and a bit of a study I did of America and Germany in terms of what's happening to those economies under the under, in part, the uh, forces of technology and, and so on, with a focus on employment. Matthew is going to sort of highlight, I don't think you can describe this whole thing, Matthew. It's an extraordinarily comprehensive document. It's highlight some of the things that he discovered in the course of this work. Um, then we'll f ask each other some questions to probe a bit and turn it over to you to have a real conversation. So I hope that sounds like a, a good plan. And as Peter said, I, I um, spent the last seven or eight years focused on emerging economy growth, where it succeeds, how fast do they grow, what does the government do to support this growth you know, that's driven by private sector dynamics and the global economy and, and openness. And, and uh, I worked with a group of people that you know, knew a whole lot more than I did. They were political and policy leaders from developing countries. I learned a ton from them and ended up writing this book, which was an attempt to share some of that learning I think one of the reasons that commission that Peter mentioned that I had the honor of chairing w w was put in place is that we'd had you know, 15 or 20 years of really extraordinary uh, growth in the emerging economies with India accelerating, China 
reforming and then growing at astonishing speeds. You know, we're talking about two countries that have 40% of the world's population that, you know, one of them, China, is now the second largest economy in the world. And it, at high speed, is not going to take it very long to be not the richest, for sure, but the, but the largest economy in the world. And at some point along the way, relatively recently, in the post-crisis period, I started to think to myself, you know, they're probably starting to have a fairly big impact on us, meaning, you know, the United States in particular. And I thought, but we really don't know what it is. So here's a very brief summary that's contained in a paper in the Council on Foreign Relations and a, and a, a more readable, less data-intensive foreign affairs piece this summer. I went back 18 years to 1990, before the crisis in 2008, and asked, where did the American economy produce jobs? Industry by industry, sector by sector. Dividing the economy as best we could into the part that competes with and trades with the rest of the world, which we call the tradable sector, and the part that has to be domestic, you know, government, most of healthcare, construction, very big part of an advanced, or any economy, frankly, is the non-tradable sector. We just don't trade everything, even though we sometimes talk like we do. And what we found when we sort of added everything up is that almost all the job growth net in the United States economy occurred in the non-tradable sector, with the leading increments coming from government, healthcare, construction, till it turned down, and the labor-intensive sectors and retail, you know, hotels, food service, and restaurants. But there's lots of others that grew too. They're just smaller and don't jump off the page. And then if you look over on the tradable side, so that's the non-tradable side, and that was 98% of the growth in employment. The, the tradable side really isn't an employment engine, or hasn't been. Um, and so the question is, what happened there? And the answer is, well, there's a, there's a bunch of sectors that employ mostly relatively highly educated people uh, in service industries that you know, succeed and benefit from the global economy and are growing in employment and in value added and incomes and all kinds of things. You could call that group of people who have the fortunate, fortune of, good fortune of working there as sort of beneficiaries of globalization. Then, there, then there's another set of industries that are more, a little more complicated. We call them manufacturing normally in ordinary language, but they're very long supply chains. And what happened, it appears, in, in, in most of those, in fact, almost all of them, is that the lower value added parts, you know, the labor intensive assembly operations and so on, they moved out of, out of our economy and into other parts of the global economy. Uh, because, in, to be perfectly honest, from an economic point of view, that's where they belong, given the states of development of those economies. And as a result, that if you net those departures, including the jobs, against the places that grew, you end up with almost no growth. And it looks, when you stand back from it, and it this was accompanied, by the way, in the American economy with, a, with something that's really quite uh, in, in slight with variations across countries is quite distinctive, which is that if you look at the, the income distribution of the country, that is how fast various parts of the income spectrum grew, the answer is in the lower and mid-range it grew very slowly over this period, and in fact even a longer period, and at the upper end it grew really quite quickly. So that when, you, when you take any standard measure of income inequality, it's rising pretty fast. And it looks like what's happening is that we're in a period in which the emerging economies actually are having a significant effect on the, uh, on the, on the structure of advanced economies in the global economy, and that, that, that it has distributional effects, both in terms of income growth and in terms of range of employment opportunities. What really happened in the American economy is a bit of a miracle. I mean, we created 27.3 million jobs in these 18 years. There's a lot of employment. And what happened is that the people in the lower part of the income spectrum that were in, in the jobs that were migrating out in the tradable side moved across the boundary, and they found employment on the non-tradable side, but they came across in sufficient numbers that, that normal market forces caused the supply to hold down the rate of growth of incomes and wages. So it's pretty easy to see what happened, but I think what we have now in the, in the American context uh, is a situation in which we have both a very difficult recovery from a balance sheet recession combined with structural imbalances because we were growing an economy. The, the, the way we managed 
to have no employment problem while this process was going on was we ran an economy on very high growth in government and health care on the one hand and a pattern of excess consumption. I mean, our savings rate in the household sector trended down to zero uh, before the crisis. It's now popped up. And of course, when you look at our economy now, you say it's not growing and not generating employment because we're short of demand. And that's absolutely right. <laughs> a whole bunch of demand uh, disappeared from the economy. Very briefly, and I'll turn it over to Matthew, uh, we looked at the German economy just to see if every economy is identical. And some of the patterns are similar. You know, most manufacturing industries in Germany, counter to the image that you get from, from people talking about it, actually declined in employment, but not as much. And the, and the main difference in Germany, in terms of the data, is that the tradable sector, unlike the American economy, remained an employment engine. It grew in the same pattern as the non-tradable side. What, what I think many people who pay attention to this know is that the Germans had a huge uh, employment and productivity and competitiveness problem around to the year 2000. They had spent 10 years uh, merging with and integrating the East and West Germany, two very different economies, and, and, and they had all kinds of problems. Uh, associated with labor market rigidities and so on. And, and, and you know, they were viewed at that time, around the year 2000, as sort of one of the basket cases in Europe. I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, given the current situation. And, and so what they did is they went to work on it. They had muted income growth. They chose employment instead of rapid increase in wages. The labor unions got together with business and government and said, look, we need the flexibility, but we want in return a commitment to employment if you look at their behavior post-crisis, they sort of reduced everybody's hours a bit and kept people. They treat, like the Dutch and some of the other northern European countries, they treat labor as sort of an asset. And you want to kind of keep it around, especially the skilled labor. And so I tell that story not to sort of sort the issue out, but rather to draw you in and to suggest that there are, in fact, though these are two economies that are advanced and are subject to the same very powerful technological and global market forces, the, the outcomes are not always uh, the same. And with that, um, I th I'll stop and, and ask Matthew to sort of highlight some of the many terribly interesting findings in this report. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, the, the, the special report is one of these things that at The Economist we regard both as a, a great blessing and a terrible uh, challenge. Um, we run about 20 of them a year and uh, we're encouraged to find some impossibly broad subject and then we're given five weeks uh, off from our normal duties to travel around and put it together and uh, it's sort of the closest it comes to like to being back at university again trying to uh, write a thesis is about 12,000 words and uh, you know, it's pretty intense. Everyone has a has to have several weeks of recovery period afterwards, despite the five weeks. <laughs> this one, I, I, I picked the, the little subject of the future of work and jobs and uh, set off on my travels. And, I mean, and, and in the course of it, went to, found myself doing such things as sitting, talking to Reid Hoffman um, in Palo Alto about LinkedIn going public and what LinkedIn meant to uh, the future of very high end professional work, and then I found myself at the other extreme in Tahrir Square in Cairo talking to um, protesters who uh, you know, had been involved in the, in, in the overthrow of the government there, and many of whom were graduate students who had expected divine work. Had, their parents had often you know, skimped and saved on the dream that educating their children would give them a better life than they had, and they just found that there, was, there were no jobs available to them and uh, you know I think that meant that both they and their parents were sort of desperate for change and I mean I guess in a way those two cases sort of exemplify uh, the broad thrust of what I wrote about in the special report which is called the great mismatch and I, at, the, at the heart of that is the idea that there are really two very different sorts of futures of work on the one hand there is um, for people who have skills and talents that are scarce, this is probably the greatest opportunity ever to find work that will make you both very rich and um, very fulfilled. Um, that The ability to 
uh, generate more or less whatever employment conditions you want to generate uh, you know, is there in Silicon Valley now. I mean, Netflix, for example, has this uh, wonderful uh, deck on, on its, ho on its uh, website about its employment policies, which includes the fact that they have no restrictions on how much vacation people take, um, which I thought was very interesting. And they said, well, people might worry about that, but we, you know, we also don't have a, a clothing policy and people don't turn up to work naked, so we're not so <laughs> worried that, um, but, but is that sort of, there, there is this sort of sense that people are being given freedom, there's empowerment to uh, delegation of decision making, that work for the people who are in demand has never been uh, better. On the, on the other extreme, there are uh, many people who face perhaps the most unappealing outlook uh, that they've ever had, uh, particularly in the developed world where people whose skills seem to have guaranteed them uh, the prospect of a good income for life and who are now finding they're not competitive uh, in global labor markets. And as Mike has said, one of the themes is clearly that for many, many millions of people in the developing world, uh, this new labor market, uh, this com combination of those two forces that I talked about has really meant unprecedented opportunity uh, and has brought many people out of poverty and has been a very positive force. But the speed of change and the failure of countries like America to really prepare for um, this new competition has left uh, a lot of people facing a very uncertain future and with real questions about what can be done uh, to make sure that, uh, or, or to turn the situation around. And I mean, I think Mike is absolutely right that uh, you know, one of the things that happened over the past decade was that America and Britain, I think, as well, took the position that um, they would go into denial and try and create an impression of things going well by borrowing a lot of money uh, and stimulating consumer demand. Um, and that created lots of jobs in industries which have now got uh, very uh, shaky futures ahead of them uh, because of the, the demand disappearing. And so, um, you know, I, uh, one of the main features, therefore, as I, as I went through it, was to ask, you know, what can be done? Are there, are there different policy responses that can um, alleviate the crisis in jobs for those in that second market, the, the difficult labor market where increasingly in the rich world you're being commoditized and the developing world is eating your lunch? Um, and this is in the context, obviously, the economist takes the view, and I think rightly so, that free trade, competitive markets are the way in which we get wealthier as a planet. Um, and you know, we believe in comparative advantage and as one of the great theories of, um, of, of economics and, 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 and also believe in the right to individual freedom to, to trade and contract with whoever you want to. And I think we believe those things do add up to a much better world. But we're at a point, I think, where these three forces that are at work of globalization, of technology change that's actually allowed us to um, get around some of the problems that have caused barriers to labor mobility through, I mean, I write about a website called Odesk and there are others out there like Elancer and so forth, which are allowing individuals to basically compete um, for jobs all around the world that are to white collar jobs that would normally not have been able to be competed for. Um, th th those two forces plus policy changes have, have made this, this labor market possible. And the question is, are, are there other policies that could be in place that would address the problems which have come from those three forces producing a speed of change that has, I think, not been experienced before? And I think your work, Mike, is very much one of the key insights, I think, is that it's just the, the sheer spe speed at which everything is changing has meant that the normal transition buffers that we have in place that, that have allowed us to manage and adjust um, when uh, globalization and technology has, has caused certain jobs to be uncompetitive, that those, thing, th those processes just aren't up to the job anymore. And so I looked, and, and I'll, I'll sum up with this, I mean, that, that I was looking at different policies that, around the world that governments might use or are using to try and manage this process better. Um, and there's a, a word that I wanted to use, uh, but I was banned from using due, by the jargon police at The Economist uh, called flexicurity. 
uh, which is this notion that what you really want to have is a combination of flexible labor markets with the state providing a sort of a, a security net around it that, that's more about sort of helping people to manage the transitions and the periods when uh, things are not going so well. Um, and, and there are examples like Germany uh, where uh, at the start of, of the century they brought in these new uh, hearts uh, laws which basically meant that um, the government would co-fund with industry uh, people to take reduced hours so they, they kept their job but basically they shared the work around amongst the workforce. That policy seems to have saved maybe 800,000 jobs in Germany that uh, would otherwise have been uh, lost and then as Germany recovered from the slump um, has grown much more quickly. There, in Britain there was a policy uh, by the Labour government which was about providing an employer of last resort function for youth unemployment and I think one of the stories that we should look into as we talk is the extent to which this particular downturn has particularly hard hit people under the age of 25. You know, Spain notoriously has a 45% unemployment rate amongst the 16 to 24 age group but you know here 30% of the unemployed, long term unemployed are now under that age group 24 to 16 which is unprecedented in America. Um, and in Britain they said, well, after one year, if you get unemployed for one year and you're under the age of 24, we'll either find you a job or put you on a training scheme. Yeah. And then there's other things which we can talk about as well, which is the extent to which the education system is fundamentally not geared up to ask and cater to the needs of industry and business, which has meant you have a skills shortage where we've actually got very high levels of vacancies being advertised in America that aren't being filled, same in, in Europe, that you know, there are plenty of jobs out there if only people had the skills to do it and can you make the university and college sector much more attentive to the needs of industry. And again, Germany's apprenticeship scheme actually seems to do that quite well. And there's also a sense in which, you know, I talk to the head of Dow Chemical and he says, you know, when he goes to Germany, he meets with Angela Merkel and they talk about what specifically does Dow Chemical have planned over the next few years, are there particular skills that it's looking for, and how can we make our education and apprenticeship scheme more responsive to that. He goes to the White House, um, doesn't get that kind of <laughs> deep questioning or any sense that America would actually be capable of responding in the way that Germany is. And so the, I, I think there's a, a fascinating moment here, and it's a, it's a real challenge to America in particular to um, recognize that it has been living in denial for the past 10 years, um, that it has many great assets, many great entrepreneurs, many great businesses, parts of the economy that are creating a lot of jobs, but it has a real structural problem uh, uh, that if it doesn't act fast, is going to leave a significant number of people, particularly young people, facing a very unattractive future where uh, they will not have the kind of fulfilling work lives that we would want them to have. So, um, Mike. Yeah, let me just add a little bit to that and then I wanted to ask Matthew a question. W one of the concerns uh, that, that is motivating the sense of urgency about this in, in a number of countries, including in the United States, is that the feeling that, or the belief, and it's based on evidence, that if people manage not to find employment coming out of, say, high school for three or four years, they, re they may never get back into the labor market. I mean, that's not a sure thing, but, but the question that's normally asked is, well, if things sort of vaguely struggle back to normal, and then the, you know, ask an employer, who are you going to employ? Somebody fresh out of high school or somebody with you know, the same kind of education who's been doing an unknown set of things for four years? You know, the answer seems to come back. You're going to employ the person coming out of high school. So you can literally lose you know, a whole bunch of people, and that has, you know, consequences in terms of everything from morality to economic efficiency. Matthew, let me ask you the following question. You could, you could, when I was reading this report, just fascinated, it occurred to me that there's sort of three problems in, in sort of general terms. One, for whatever reasons we may have in various places in the world, or even in the aggregate, a shortage of the supply of jobs relative to the demand. 
The second issue is, was, is captured in the title, which we have this mismatch problem. You know, we've got, you know, the, the demand side, demand meaning demand for people, you know, as, is asking for a certain set of things and the supply side for whatever reason hasn't adjusted to that or actually the way I think about it is they both haven't adjusted. So let's say problem two is the, is the mismatch problem, skills mismatch, whatever you want to call it. And the, and the third, um, the third one is what you might call distribution, you know, that is even though stuff is working, we sort of don't like the distributional consequences measured either in terms of incomes or incomes relative to expectations, or even the range of opportunities for work and how rewarding or not they are for, for various different kinds of people. I, you know, we talk about unemployment as if you know, there was one bucket and it's either full or not, but you have to remember that people come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes and stripes, and they're capable of doing and want to do, have preferences with respect to different things. So I put, would put distribution as number three, mismatch as number two, and a shortage of the supply of jobs as number one. You spent a lot of time in a lot of different places. Do you have a sense of, you know, if you had to put your finger on it, are the, all of the above or, you know, I mean, in the post-crisis period, what's our problem? Well, I think it is all of the above. I think, um, you know, it's interesting here at the moment, the debate about fiscal policy and, the, and, and whether you can have a stimulus. I mean, it's pretty clear that um, if America hadn't got long-term questions over its fiscal health, you, know, you would be able to justify a strong stimulus because you know, demand is quite weak and there are some obvious areas where you would want to put money to work in terms of you know, modernizing the infrastructure and, and so forth. Um, and that Equally, it is quite clear that the state of financial markets at the moment, uh, the fact that China and others you know, are starting to say, well, we don't really know whether we want to buy debt from you if, it's, if, if we don't really trust your, your prudence, um, you know, that, that America is, is constrained. And so we at The Economist have said, well, you, know, you, you need to do two things simultaneously. You need to stimulate and you need to provide a, a, a credible plan uh, for you know, reducing the deficit over the long haul. And, you know, I guess we feel at the moment that there doesn't seem to be a lot of sign of that credible plan coming out of Washington, and there's a, a really depressing sense that it's going to be quite a long time, at least one presidential election and perhaps more, before that kind of leadership is, is coming. And so that really is starting to constrain the ability of America to, to stimulate in the way that might make sense in the short run. Um, the other extreme, you know, I do think that um, yeah, there are that there, there, there is a real change in the way labour markets work uh, for two reasons: the globalisation reason, and also the technology change mm -hmm. reason. That 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 are going to produce outcomes that are um, more and more unequal. Um, that particularly at the top, um, you know, your ability to be a superstar in a global market you know, is, is growing. And at the same time, for the average worker and below, I think technology is going to move on in leaps and bounds in terms of disintermediating and removing and completely destroying jobs that existed before. And it, you know, I, th I, I think a lot of companies have been surprised during this last two or three years that they were able to reduce their workforce significantly um, and actually improve their performance dramatically and feel that they did that through a better use of technology and that actually maybe there's a lot more potential to apply that technology and to take out another round of jobs. And I think they don't want to do that at the moment, but there, there's, a, there's certainly a sense that they are not looking to increase employment and it's not just because the demand outlook is uncertain, it is also because they feel they could probably do much more with the same amount or less workers than before. And so that outcome does produce more and more inequality. And, you know, I, I mean, this is why uh, this is one of the themes of philanthropic capitalism is that, you know, that what is the social com contract between the winners and the rest? You know, is there a sense in which the successful need to reinvest in society in a different way and, and to give away uh, some of what they've made. 
And I think you know, clearly the missing, the missing link and the part of that social contract that should be a priority is, 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 is really reforming the education system to give more people a better chance of being competitive in that, that unequal labour market. But I mean, I do think there, is a, there needs to be a real debate about the social compact. And it's very interesting to see people like Howard Schultz at Starbucks, you know, talking, I spoke to him last week, he said, look, I'm, I'm a guy who grew up poor in Brooklyn and became a poster child for the American dream. And I'm really beginning to worry that that American dream doesn't exist anymore in America, that it's become harder and harder for people to work their way out of poverty uh, into success. And that, and, and that has huge social implications. And you, you see Warren Buffett talking about how he should pay more tax. And I think he's tapping into that same unease about, um, about what happened, what might happen socially due to inequality. And you know, I do think people are much more you know, successful people in, in politics are much more freaked out by the Occupy Wall Street movement than perhaps if you look carefully at the movement itself. It, they ought to be in one way because it doesn't have a very coherent agenda. But I think they are, what they're worried about is that there is clearly a real question about the sustainability of a world where you have this inequality and a lack of hope for people, for many people at the bottom of the income spectrum. Yeah, there seems to be a very widespread, I mean, if you look around the world, um, you know, it's not the same, but you go from Egypt, where you were, to Tunisia, you know, to lots of places where there's a youth unemployment problem combined with social networking produces instant ability to organize. You, you started to get it here. You had, I, you can comment on this better than I had, but pr a pretty violent demonstrations in the UK. At, uh, what, a couple of months ago? M maybe that had a different source. Um, so, so there does seem to be sort of an issue in, in, in back in America. I mean, you have a sense that well, our social contract, if we had one, is different from most of the European ones. The European ones is more protective of people. They've adapted how they protect people away from protecting companies and industries. You can see this clearly in the German case, but it's much broader than that to protecting people directly, you know, because so, if you protect companies, jobs, specific jobs and in, in, in industries, then you muck up the, the sort of competitive dynamics that, that, that uh, gives rise to, you know, wealth growth over time. So, so, and in America, I mean, I think the social contract in as crude as possible form was there's upward mobility, there's a lot of opportunity, you're sort of more or less on your own, but if you work hard, there's a lot of opportunity, and that contract doesn't look very good if the second part of that, which is there's a lot of opportunity, seems to be on the wane. Uh, but let me just ask you before we turn it over to the, to the audience, what, 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 say a little bit more about the European situation, including the UK. What, what did you find when you were there? Similar sets of issues, or are the problems fundamentally? Well, I mean, I think within the, within the European Union, there's probably three different stories going on. I mean, there, there's the story of, of the Greeks and the other, the, the so-called pigs economies, where, I mean, essentially, they have had to make dramatic cutbacks because they, they just over-leveraged themselves. And you've got a lot of public sector workers being laid off. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, in Ireland, for example, a lot of migrant workers who'd come in from Central Europe have gone back home. Um, and there's just a lot of uh, misery around. Um, and yep. a lot of people waiting to see what's going to happen to the Eurozone and whether it can sort out its, its debt problems. And on that story, I mean, my sense is that, you know, you have to view that from a very long political perspective that, you know, about the creation of a European state that's much more like the United States than, than what Europe has been historically. And they will find a way to save the Euro because it's so crucial to their view of how that super state is going to, to come about. And what you have is 17 sovereign states battling over the terms at which that will be created, the federal apparatus will be created. And then a, a number of other states like Britain that are not in the Euro that are figuring out whether they can throw sand in the works or, or whatever, or benefit from it in some way. So, a, so you've basically got this very, very bureaucratic process. And I met with the head of the European 
at the President of the European Union a few weeks ago during the Clinton Global Initiative, and he was basically saying, you know, they tell us that we should be ahead of the market as a government, and we are you know, constitutionally incapable of being ahead of the market. So it's just going to be a very, very bumpy road for maybe a year or two while they sort this out. Yeah. Um, and then you've got, I mean, you've got the story of Germany, which, as you say, is a great story of a government that recognised it had real competitiveness problems um, a decade ago and, and took steps to change its labour market in ways that uh, reduced the union, some of the union bureaucracy, but actually introduced other facilities that made the market able to, to withstand short-term shocks and come out stronger the other side. And then you've got somewhere like Britain, which actually is probably the closest in structure to the United States in terms mm -hmm. of the labour market, very low protection. Um, and Britain's unemployment rate didn't rise anything like as much as America's did. I mean, Britain has 7.5% unemployment compared to whatever, 9% here. Mm -hmm. um, now, that may start to change because the government has come in, the coalition government has come in and, and very aggressively cut government spending in order to uh, reduce the deficit and uh, make sure that there's no run on British debt and, and that it's able to still tap the international capital markets. And that austerity package may actually mean that Britain now has a rather longer recession over the next couple of years that um, you know, we'll see the unemployment rate rise again, we'll see. Um, but fundamentally, there were policies in place like this employer of last resort, future jobs fund, that really targeted the unemployed young, guaranteed them a job or a place in higher in, in training. Mm -hmm. um, and now you've got um, also, uh, the, the coalition now has this, probably the most aggressive use of uh, incentivizing private intermediaries to come into the labor market and get the unemployed back to work. So there, there's a scheme where they're basically saying, putting out to tenders to private companies, this deal whereby if they can get an unemployed, long-term unemployed person into a job that they keep for a year, they will be paid a very nice amount for doing that, but they'll get nothing if they don't get that person into a job that they keep for a year. And so it's going to be very interesting to see whether that kind of private carrot and stick contract can really change rather entrenched patterns in the labour market. I mean, lastly, I mean, you have the Spain story, which I think is also worth thinking about where you do have 45% unemployment amongst the 16 to 24 year olds in Spain. And that tells you a lot about how parts of Europe have responded to this historic uh, inflexibility of their labor markets and the move towards more flexible labor markets. In Spain, they basically said, anyone that's in a job keeps the old inflexible contract and anyone coming into the labor market has a super flexible contract. And the result was that when the Spanish economy turned down, everyone on the flexible contract got fired, and that tended to be all the young people. Right. And then, you know, there's no, so, so I think you know, when you have a deeply bifurcated labor market like that, you really are asking for trouble. And you know, they are changing the rules in Spain, but maybe too late at this mm -hmm. point for many of those young people. Is that your sense? I mean, you looked at Germany. I mean, did you see, do you see many other countries looking at the German experience and saying, well, we need to follow that route? Yeah, or independently getting to similar positions. I, I had the opportunity, a conference we had here to listen to an account of how they went about the same kind of thing and approached labor in, um, in uh, Holland and, 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 or in the Netherlands. And, and, it, and it had very similar sounding characteristics to what you've described and what we see in the German case, you know, the sort of spreading of the pain. Let me just say a word in addition about income distribution. One of the things that, that I did is I, when I looked at America and, and Germany, I thought, well, these are different outcomes in terms of employment. But then I went, not that this would be a surprise to anybody who knows the data, but I went and looked at the income distributions. And so, you know, there's a tendency for people to get fascinated with the top 1% or the top half a percent. But the truth is, you know, the top 1% tends to be, you know, people who are sort of stars and something, right? They're great entrepreneurs, you know, they're great athletes, you know, it could be Michael Schumacher, it could be Stephen Jobs or, you know, but I mean, it's not, 
the main event. So, and it, so I went and looked at well, the standard data, which is that the they, people take the top 10% or the top 20%. So let me take the top 20%, the average income. So those are the people who are managing enterprises and whatnot and have high level professional jobs to the bottom 20%. That ratio in Germany is around 4.3 uh, times, right? If you take the same ratio in the United States, it's 8.5 times. Now, I don't know exactly how to interpret this, but those are, that is a very big difference. Uh, and the American one is rising. And what, what I think happened in Germany is that they realized that a component of restoring their ability to generate jobs, particularly on the tradable side, involved re restraint on the growth of income, at least for a period of time. Uh, and this is a very general problem. I mean, to take an aside, Greece is 40% out of bounds in per estimated, 40% out of bounds in productivity. And so if they magically solve the, uh, the uh, fiscal problem, which is huge, you know, somebody just gave them enough money to reduce the debt to manageable levels, there's no way it can grow. Well, you're not if they're 40% out of bounds. So these numbers matter. And what happened, I think, in Germany is because of the nature of the agreements and the institutional structure with labor involved in management, you know, this, this income restraint occurred over a very broad spectrum of the income distribution, whereas in the American case, it occurred where the market forces said it had to occur, and then this other group that, w that we both talked about, you know, the ones who find the global economy a pretty interesting, expanding set of opportunities, you know, experienced ra very rapid growth in income. Put it differently, the German case looks like th they somehow institutionally overrode certain kinds of market outcomes that we probably uh, yeah. wouldn't do in America or the UK. I think it's quite interesting. I mean, a lot of this has happened in the last decade, really. Right. And I think a lot of that is associated with attitudes towards equity and share options, which you know, clearly in the first, from the mid 90s to the middle of the last decade, a lot of share options were basically rewarding people for happening to have the options rather than for their performance because they were so badly designed and they were, there was a bubble in the stock market and a lot of people got very rich for doing nothing. And um, whereas in Germany, there was a very important, uh, rather public labor, uh, legal dispute over Mannesmann and its executive share ownership. And it kind of sent a message to German executives that they didn't want to be seen as having taken too much of the equity. And I think that just that decision alone probably accounts for some of the difference. Some of this difference, yeah. yeah. Lastly, you spent some time th talking and thinking about educational effectiveness, relative educational performance and so on. What did you find there and what did you... Well, I, mean, I think there's clearly people who have a university degree and higher degree uh, are faring much better um, in the labour market than those who don't. And the people who are really being hit are those that either don't graduate school in the American sense, so high school in the American sense, or who graduate not very impressively. And, um, but, but clearly unemployment has gone up even amongst graduates. And um, you know, I, I think my colleague Adrian Wooldridge, who runs the Schumpeter column in The Economist, I mean, he's been writing a bit about how there's, he's predicting that there will be more and more bifurcation amongst those that have education between those who have got market, uh, marketable skills and those that have uh, you know, been educated in things that you know, may, may seem more like a hobby or leisure pursuit than uh, real saleable knowledge. And so uh, and I, I think one of the things that was striking in uh, Egypt, which I think I hadn't expected, was the extent to which um, you know, a lot of education systems have been designed around a particular view of work that is no longer true and that people are coming out thinking they're going to get a job. They don't really have any clue as a student what the world of work is going to look like. And they're just the skills they have. They, they, they don't know how to work. They don't have, I mean, India, for example, you know, people come out of universities in India and they have to spend three months being trained in the basics of what it's like to be in an office, how you get on along with other people, how you present yourself in a confident way. And so, you know, Emphasis and Wipro, for example, have these world-class universities that are really about the fact that India itself doesn't have world-class universities, or you know, has a lot, of, obviously has some, but many of the people coming to the workforce just don't have the basic human skills around working. And you know, I think education's going to have to change to to prepare people for a much more 
flexible, changeable labour market where they're going to have to take much more responsibility for how their career pans out and to be willing to re-educate them, lifetime learning themselves and lifetime learning and all that sort of stuff, uh, which I don't think people in traditional education establishments really have a clue about. Probably relevant to the aging problem. All right, I think this is very useful. So we're going to uh, change gears here and turn it over to you. There's microphones here, or we can bring them around, and I invite you to join the the conversation. Uh, Hi. This question is for Mr. Spence. To just spring off of what you were talking about now, with for most of the students here today to um, to make their uh, careers and things they study more marketable. You made an interesting point earlier when you talked about how the head of Dow Chemical goes to Angela Merkel in Germany, and she asks him what needs they have and what jobs they need so that they gear the education towards that. And you said when they go to the White House it sort of falls on deaf ears. So if we were to um, reverse that and have the students be more proactive, and instead of saying, when I grow up, I want to be, when I grow up, I want to be where the needs are, how would you um, suggest the students here in this auditorium gear what they're planning to do towards what's needed because it's not happening from the White House side in the US, and how can they be more proactive to make their career more marketable, so to speak, when they get out into the work environment? I think that was actually meant for you. <laughs> you have a go. <laughs> All right. I have always thought, you know, regardless of what level of education you're in, that, that you're creating um, flexibility, I guess is the term Matthew used, or I sometimes use the term optionality. That is, you're creating options you know, that you can exercise over a broad front. And if you try to translate that into a curriculum, I think it means, it doesn't mean being superficial uh, in everything that you study, but it means breadth. I mean, I have said the same thing to PhD students, you know. You don't know how your discipline's going to go, and you don't know where the re interesting research ideas are going to come from, but if you are mucking around in several places, then you got a better chance of sort of latching on to one and, and I think, you know, probably what you've been hearing us both say in different ways is that, that that has not been the traditional model. It has been, I think, you know, the hallmark of an MBA program, for example, in, in, at least in America, that kind of general attitude and approach. Many people go to an MBA program because it expands their horizons, and I think we try to do our best to, to, to make sure that, that it fulfills that function. Uh, and then that involves broadening knowledge. I think the problem is that, you know, we are now struggling with the fact that a much wider range of people in various categories of work and various categories of education are going to need this kind of um, skill. Part of it is, you know, right now, the ability to adapt to a rapidly changing environment and, and intertemporally, an ability to change, uh, to, in a sense, to re-educate yourself with help. Um, and, that, and that problem gets even more specific, significant when you realize that our life expectancy is going up and, and at some point our working lives are going to be longer. And so the length of time we're, you know, sort of out there working, trying to find our place in these markets is going to go up. I mean, I, one of the interesting conversations I had was with uh, Dick Bollas, who's the author of What Color Is My Parachute, um, which is 40 years has been... You know, talking about you know, how do you get the job of your dreams. And he says he, this year he's rewritten it really to be about survival in the labour market. And he made a couple of points which I thought were particularly relevant. Um, one was that you know, we've, we've gone dr dramatically from a period where um, people like yourselves, the graduate educated students, were leaving university and feeling that they could take an entry-level job that would be on their terms and that, 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 it, that, that, that to one where basically the employer is again deciding on their terms uh, for entry-level people you know what 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 the job is going to be and who they want so it's gone from being a seller's market to a buyer's market 
very, very dramatically. And, that, and the, in that world, you need to behave very, very differently. And you have to be far more willing to go to where the jobs are, um, to be mobile, uh, to take stuff that you wouldn't necessarily have considered before. But also, I mean, he was saying that, you know, that, that in that environment, you've got to be much more entrepreneurial in saying, where do I see an unmet need that I could fill, rather than expecting it to be handed to you. And, and, and that people, you know, that mindset is a very different mindset. And I think, you know, particularly for, for university students coming into this labor market, you know, it is a very difficult labor market, even though it, there is this skill shortage and you have to be much more entrepreneurial and expect it to be much tougher. You know, a lot of advice on you know, using your network of people that you know, asking people to help you in, in finding work to be a bit more desperate than maybe you would, would have been acceptable to be you know, four years ago. Your posse, was that the word? Posse? Oh, well, the posse thing, that's quite interesting. One of the, uh, one of the uh, London Business School writer, uh, Linda Gratton, has got a book out called The Shift, which is actually quite a good read on how do you navigate this new labor market. And she says, you know, one of the things that everyone ought to be part of is a posse of, uh, you know, in the sort of Wild West sense, I think more than the hip hop sense. Um, that is sort of uh, the kind of where you, you, know, you expect people, you, you have a whole group of people that you know you can turn to in a crisis to sort the situation out. And uh, it's kind of an ad hoc group that you bring together and, and so forth. And, and get to be part of one of those okay. seems to be her message. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, it doesn't seem to be on. Is it working now? Okay, yeah, great. it's working. Thanks. Yep. Um, so um, it, it occurred to me, and this is a, a, a comment, I'm interested in your thoughts, that there might be two assumptions or myths that complicate our policy decisions. Or one is that, um, and I don't know if you were saying this, uh, Professor Spence, that making things is better than, ma making tradable goods is better than making non-tradable goods. Um, I mean, I think if you look at very far into the future, I imagine there's going to be a time where we're not really making anything that's tradable, that we're, machines are making things, and we're all we're providing are services, you know, waiting tables, providing massages, um, you know, doing surgery. Um, and so that, so it, if that might kind of complicate our, if, if, we're, if our focus on is making tradable goods, is that, is that an assumption we should be making? Number one, and then it's also tied to another assumption, which is that um, you know, uh, I think which is you referred to um, it, as mostly occurs in America. Is there's an idea that you want to get ahead, and it may be at a time in the future that being a masseuse is just you know is a great job and is a stable job, and and there's but there's a perception in America that it's not high status, and you kind of. You're disappointing your parents if all you are is a massage uh -huh. therapist. So Sorry. I'm wondering if those two assumptions might exist and if they get us into trouble. Well, there's, I have three responses to that. I'll just be really quick. The tradable sector is goods and services. So you know, a lot of people think we trade only goods and it's sort of manufacturing. That's just not right. And I'm personally agnostic. I mean, I don't believe you can run an economy that slowly disappears from the tradable sector. It's just unbalanced. It's not right. But I'm agnostic on what the sort of range of things are that, you know, I think that in, the, in emerging economy policy terms, that's something to be discovered by a combination of policy experimentation and market forces. And it's not something we should decide in advance. And I, and I think the second point you made is absolutely right. You know, the, 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 we forget that people love doing different things and the many people will be very happy doing being a masseuse, doing a lot of different things. And if that aspect of matching all worked, in, to use Matthew's terms, that would, be, that would be super. There's one other thing that's going on, which is a, a shift in values. You know, we are, we are consuming a lot of stuff in the advanced countries, and some people are saying, that's enough, right? That's not where happiness comes from, you know? Uh, and we ought to sort of, and we are in fact, in, in a sense, in the process of shifting our values around. I, I, I guess what I think about that is I'm very sympathetic to that. If you said that in a poor country, 
you probably wouldn't get as good a reception. <laughs> but I think that, that the enough is enough doesn't explain, ex extend to productive employment. I think an important part of many people's lives is the opportunity, however they exercise it, to be productively employed and to, to have it be relatively rewarding. And I think that's the, the mm. issue that we were wrestling with. Matt. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, I did a conversation with another Nobel Prize winning economist or actually psychologist, uh, Danny Kahneman, Danny the Kahneman, other week, yeah. who was saying basically you know, $75,000 income seems to be the point at which you stop getting ha any happier. Um, and so I suppose there is a point in which, you know, I guess, you know, maybe the value shift is that at a certain point we, we should, it, you know, people who, who judge their degree of success in the labor market by earning considerably more than $75,000, you know, maybe barking up the wrong tree. And if, you know, th there may be other ways of saying this is worthwhile work than using the, the money benchmark. And so, you know, and likewise, Peter Thiel, uh, who I interviewed for the special report, who has this prize, 100,000 grants to get people to drop out of university and start businesses. I mean, his view is, you know, the Wall Street job engine is going to run out of steam and that people really, you know, successful, ambitious young people face a choice increasingly between going to work in Silicon Valley and creating a startup or, you know, moving to North, he said, moving to North Dakota and starting an organic garden and basically becoming self-sufficient. And that's a reasonable choice to make. And, you know, maybe that's how we should see the world, that there's going to be more and more of that second option being uh, the norm rather than the, the first. Peter Thiel was the major investor in Facebook. So he's doing pretty well. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hi. I seems um, to want to live on a floating tax haven as far as I can see. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I work at a, a global concern, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty happy with my life and the choices I've made. Right. Uh, except for the fact that I'm really nervous, uh, and I'm nervous because I have cousins and nieces and other people that may that some have not made the choices I've made, and you know, and some. Uh, may not make the choices I've made in the uh, made in the past, and may not make the choices I've made in the future. Uh, they used to say a rising tide lifted all ships, but I think the last ten years' data clearly says that that's not actually true. It lifts some ships really high, and others it leaves at the dock. Uh, so, my question: What really concerns me is, you know, we say class warfare is a we throw the term around, but it's something that's actually happening. And the reason why I say it's happening is because I was reading today that, you know, that actually the far left and far right had something very much in common on the recent vote on the House of, you know, on the, in the House of Representatives. The Speaker wouldn't allow it to come to a floor vote because he knew the vote against China would actually pass. Uh, so, you know, the elite of the elite wouldn't allow the vote to pass. And I say all that to say this, why do we speak about globalization as though it's something that we have no choice in. I mean, we removed trade bar There used to be a time in this country where we actually had trade agreements that we negotiated every year. And we negotiated those trade agreements and we did it according to our interests at the particular time. Now we have trade agreements that aren't negotiated every year. They're just blanket negotiations or they're put in the hands of an extra state body. So my question is, what would be the impact of basically rolling back some of these you know, ideas or some of these institutions that have basically served one group of people, my group of people, incredibly well, and the rest, not at all. I mean, to, let me have first shot at that. I mean, Absolutely. It seems to me, you know, the fact that you're getting South Korea trade agreement pushed through Congress at this particular moment in time does show, you know, that actually the evidence that free trade helps job creation and helps wealth creation is pretty powerful because this is not a Congress that would uh, normally do that uh, if there wasn't some pretty uh, clear bipartisan logic for doing it. And, and the fact that those trade agreements with South Korea and Colombia and other places have been on ice for so long, you know, I think speaks very badly uh, for, for the American process. The evidence, you know, go back to the 1930s when you had all that protectionism came in, that clearly made the Great Depression much worse than it needed to be. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, what, what's interesting about, what I thought was very interesting about Mike's analysis was, you know, clearly 
if we weren't sitting here, if we were sitting in Shanghai and talking about the global economy, we'd be just saying this is the most fantastic world uh, that many of the people in the audience would ever have, have known and they're beyond the dreams of their parents. So this is a great time to be alive, a great, a great time to, be, to have talents that are, you know, to be well educated and to, to, this is, the world is your oyster. And I, 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 the thing that I found you know, oddest uh, talking to colleagues is who you know, could come up to me and say, oh, I read your special report. I'm really worried about my children. Are they ever gonna have a kind of job that's as good as working in uh, advertising sales for The Economist or whatever? And I, I say to them, well, look, <laughs> you know, frankly, you, know, you, you, you are investing in your child. You, they are going to the best schools, some of the best schools in the world. Um, you know, you are a great parent. Your, chi your child is gonna have a fant if, if you keep the globalized, if you keep China and India and others, Brazil growing and, and more and more people coming out of poverty into the mainstream, you know, th there's going to be a much bigger world economy and your child will have probably much greater opportunities than children currently entering the labour market had, let alone children entering 10 or 20 years ago. So you know, we mustn't lose sight of that overall optimistic story, even though it clearly is presenting this transitional challenge that you know, I think is, you know, needs to be taken much more seriously in which you highlighted, Mike. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it is an, it, you're right to point it out. It is an option. But you want to be very careful about exercising it uh, because it will produce a response and because it has consequences for everybody else. I mean, you know, one of the things the global, I mean, I grew up in Canada. Canada, Australia, and New Zealand thought it would be a nice idea to have diversified economies, even though they're relatively small. So the way they did it is they protected you know, various industries, lots of them, you know, automobiles, you name it. And, and they all abandoned this policy 20 years ago. Do you know why? Because the, the tariff required to, to protect a domestic industry to the point where it was viable in the, in, you know, vis-a-vis -vis international competition was something like 85%, or in round numbers, you had to make the cost of a car double for everybody who was buying it, regardless of where they bought it, in order to have a domestic industry. And, and so I guess what I, my response would be this. If you can solve the employment problem and it has income distribution implications, there's all kinds of ways to redistribute income. You know, but probably not the best option to exercise first is to make almost everything that everybody in the country buys more expensive, which is what would happen if you engaged in protectionism, and that's before you got the response from the other side. So it is an option. And you know, from a political point of view, if we don't solve some of these problems, I think it'll become a more salient political option because people will start to think there isn't any alternative. And I think that would be a sad place to arrive at, you know, five to 10 years from now. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, I, this is on. I think that the protectionist question is very interesting. However, I don't, I don't think we can debate whether a job here in the US is any different than a job in Brazil. So I was wondering if we could return to the data and look at the world, and if you can compare the growth rates, population growth rates, with job creation growth rates worldwide. With job creation? Yeah, I mean, I, so we'll both take a shot at that really quickly. Um, Roughly, the reason it's hard to answer the question is that the global, if you look at the emerging economies, the, they, depending on what stage of development they're at, they're, they have two parts. They have traditional sectors, what we call traditional sectors, mostly agriculture and things around agriculture, in which there's large amounts of surplus labor, just as Sir Arthur Lewis said. And, and so what's going on in those economies is the surplus labor is, um, new employment is created in the more modern growing part of the economy, sometimes export, sometimes domestically, and people are flowing from the traditional sectors in, in that, that really is a pretty good description of the growth engines that's running. And so when you ask the question, you know, are we creating jobs faster than employment growth? If you mean jobs, you know, that are relatively high productivity and in the modern economy now, we're creating them way faster than population growth because we're, we're, we literally have hundreds of millions of people who have moved across that boundary and moved out of poverty. That's the good part of this story. 
Um, now, if you say, well, but the people who came from you know, those surplus labor environments, you know, where the population growth tends to be high, especially in poor countries, they had jobs, kind of, you know, uh, then it's harder to answer the question. But you, you see what I mean. Basically, the relevant, I think, I guess what I'm really saying is the relevant question is how fast are relatively higher productivity jobs integrated in a, in a modern economy being created? And the answer is the miracle of the post-war period is that that number keeps going up and up and up, accelerating. And that's really the underlying explanation for why so many people on the place of the planet are so much better off. Yeah. Well, should we just take these three questions? <coughs> yeah, let's one take go these and three and let you go home. Up. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Um, sorry. Um, good evening. Um, with in all of the recent uh, Republican presidential debates, they've blamed the sort of loss of jobs in the tradable sector to two things. So that's high taxes and sort of restrictive government uh, institutions such as the EPA. Um, do you think that sort of rolling back on these institutions as well as sort of implementing a low tax scheme, you know, such as Herman Cain's 999 plan, um, do you think <laughs> that would actually create an increase in jobs in sort of America's tradable sector? Or is there sort of um, such a strong, um, you know, structural problem behind their sort of competitiveness that it actually wouldn't cause companies to move back to America? Let's take, should we take the other two as well? Or, 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 yeah, let's have do the that, time and then we'll answer them all. Yeah, yeah. yes ma'am. You'll have to jump. Oh, we, we got <laughs> I got it, I got it. Yeah. Let's see, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Um, referring back to the mismatch issue of supply and demand, um, you were saying before that in India, they, um, people spend like three months in training to gain like interpersonal skills, communication skills that would work in business. Um, in South America, there's this problem where there are about 18 psychologists per engineer that are graduating in the recent years. So my question would be, like, what do you think would be better for the economy in the future to make education focus more on giving people like a core education that will allow them to grow in the workforce in whatever field they choose or to get the number of engineers higher than the number of psychologists? <laughs> engineers versus psychologists. Very good. Okay. <laughs> And you'll you say your last, your last question. Uh, thank you. I uh, really appreciate this uh, opportunity of this public forum. I just wanted to uh, underline one really important aspect of the kind of things I'm doing here in New York, and that is we've got to talk to each other more. Mm. You are sitting next to somebody from China, Thailand, somebody from Brazil, somebody from Jamaica. You are probably some of the most important people on this planet. This is a knowledge economy. And you are that knowledge. And the fact that you talk to each other, you've got friends in government, you've got friends in corporations abroad, you need that international reach because it's a possibility the American economy may be in the doldrums for the next 10 years. But if you've got friends who are in government or friends who need services and consultancy, crunching the numbers, double checking what the IMF tells the, the government or certain institutions in your local sphere around the globe, there should be some kind of partnership. And this is something I'd like for you to uh, re uh, reflect on. Is there a way for some of the universities here in New York where there's such a variety of nationalities coming together for learning to turn around and say, we can have you on an internship whereby you're going to go abroad because we want you on a plane every four months to be able to meet people who are doing things on the ground that need your knowledge. And okay. you become the matchmaker here at these universities because yeah. you've got all these students from all over the world anyway. Okay, well, I mean, I think that's a you know, really good idea. And I think actually, you know, this is one of the you know, we do need to embrace the idea this is a global economy. I think, I'm sure most people in this room do. Uh, but there are, you know, the technology does, I think, allow a degree of interaction between uh, people around the world that, you know, and collaboration, all sorts of innovation that, you know, again, we just haven't seen possible even two or three years ago. The technology wasn't as good as it is today. Um, I want to take the uh, tax question uh, briefly, I mean, it does seem to me, you know, there, there are some real problems with the tax system as it stands uh, in America at the moment that, 
you know, it, it's become one of the, it, it, the headline rate of corporate tax, for example, is amongst the highest in the world. But there are just the extraordinary loopholes all over the place, which are the result of all the sort of politicking over the years, which has meant that some, some businesses, like General Electric, for example, basically pay no tax in America, and others pay quite heavy rates of tax. And I think you know, the, the case for reforming the tax system to make it uh, a lower marginal rate of tax and get rid of a lot of the loopholes, you know, it, I think is very, very powerful. Um, and you know, I th I, I, I th whether I think that as a whole um, it's the primary problem that America faces, I, I don't really think it's a huge uh, source of the current crisis. I think that's much more to do with uh, the amount of indebtedness that America built up, the failure to improve the education system uh, in particular. Um, and as for this, you know, the EPA and regulation, I mean, I, I think in some ways you could argue that getting a proper carbon policy in place <coughs> in America, taking seriously the need to create very high uh, standards of uh, environmental compliance, um, you know, would actually probably help America uh, America's competitiveness in some ways because you know it, it would actually raise standards and make it harder for companies from uh, less advanced economies to be competitive in in what would be very high high quality technologically developed products so I think that the, yeah, the Republicans are wrong on on that one obviously you do have to weigh up is this is this regulation in the short run designed in a way that's going to have a disproportionately bad impact on certain companies and you want to manage the introduction of it. But I think, you know, that I, I think that it's just a convenient um, target for, from a rhetorical point of view rather than a, a serious issue. And I think probably often used by people who are in deep denial about climate change, which is, you know, unfortunate. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> so, I don't know, psychologists versus engineers. I mean, I actually think that... Um, I think probably though, you know, you do want to have, you know, skills that are going to be valuable in the global labour market. Now, I actually suspect that people who learn psychology, you know, that that they probably ought to be, if they're any, if they've been well taught, you know, very good at entering all sorts of service profession jobs. And so, I wouldn't necessarily be so worried about them. It's possibly more people learning uh, know, classics or theatre studies or something that maybe. Uh, less, but even then, you know, there are lots of <laughs> that may actually be a brilliant uh, for marketing jobs. So I don't know; these things are not so straightforward. <laughs> okay, well, I'll get my foot in my mouth too. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about the excellent uh, NYU theatre studies course. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but let's, I, we're, we're, we've, we're almost done here, so I'll just be brief. In the I, Economist studio, we all talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there is a, a bit of a tension on the engineers or psychologists. You want well-trained people, but you do want, you know, a, a degree of some kind of flexibility, all right? So it isn't just matching narrow skills to, to, to other things. And, and, and I think in education, you want not just cognitive skills, but what they sometimes call non-cognitive skills. It's a sort of curiosity, you know, kind of energy devoted to to kind of discovering new things and so on. So I, I think that's all along the right lines. And, and what I learned about that is that the single most important lever in that respect is, uh, is, is even more important than the quality of the educational system in the early stages, in, and this is very relevant in emerging economies, is, is childhood nutrition and stimulation. It's, you've heard about that in, in, in our country as well. But, if, if you're malnourished for a long period of time, there's a permanent diminution in your capacity to acquire these skills. So it doesn't matter how good the, the school system is, the, the scientists tell us this is pretty well established. So if you wanted to put your finger on the one thing that you would do to eliminate not only impairment of you know, potential in terms of the economy, but also in individuals and in a, in a kind of the world's kind of most massive form of unfairness, it would be you'd go after malnutrition. One of the reasons that the global economy, the Bob Zellick at the World Bank went after 
you know, the, the rise in commodity prices, which you may recall occurred in 2008, just before the crisis, is it threatened malnutrition of exactly this kind on a prolonged basis, globally, across, you know, all countries that have people living at the margin who are poor. Um, you know, I think the idea of using the uh, diversity of this community effectively uh, in integrating with people around the globe is, is not only a, a terrific idea, but I think it's consistent with the NYU's mission. NYU's becoming a multinational sort of entity, uh, and, and I, under the leadership of its president, John Sexton, and I think that's partly intended to the, the model, if you like, the business model that John is using is New York is a kind of gathering place, you know, where these links and, 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 and human capital in the collective sense gets built up and it can be deployed. Uh, nationally, we're sort of using New York's special characteristics. That's a very good idea. On, on the taxes, and I agree with Matthew, but I'll, I'll just say, I, I, there's a list of things that I think we could go after that might improve our performance in terms of employment and, and uh, opportunity. They would include sort of skills training and in institutions like that that we talked about. They would include going after the parts of our educational system that are less effective than they might be. I would put in um, a sensible energy policy, a tax system that at least is understandable and doesn't require 25 volumes to sort of write it out and employ most of the highest priced talent in the legal profession to sort of figure out how to get around it. Uh, it's just nonsense. I mean, there's just, there's no reason for that. You'd probably have to finish the health care reform in a sensible way. And I was talking with Alan Kruger, who's one of the best labor economists in the country and the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. He has some data, I haven't received it yet, that suggests that, that when our health care costs rocketed up even further in the period since 2000, that that actually looked like it had caused movement of, uh, of businesses across the boundary into Canada. Now, I, I don't want to announce that as an empirical finding, but I mean, this is a big enough chunk of cost that if businesses absorb it, you might find that it's sort of starting to affect. Um, last comment on that is we do have to be careful in a world in which we're competing for activity, the economic activity, about what things we think we can do unilaterally and what things we ought to do in coordination with other countries. You know, this discussion comes up in financial services. So, you know, if we have a set of regulations that are designed to make our financial system, you know, less dangerous uh, than it apparently has been, it's still better to try to do that, you know, in conjunction with other people. Otherwise, I mean, there's no industry that's better at moving stuff around than the financial services industry. So the Europeans are talking about a transaction or sometimes called a Tobin tax. And almost everybody I've talked to about that say, that's not a terrible idea, but you don't want to do it by yourself. You know, this is something that we ought to sit down, the plausible places, you know, that include Singapore, Shanghai, you know, uh, so Johannesburg, London, and a number of other places and agree that this is a system that we would have. So, so I, don't, I, I doubt if those tax proposals are the right ones, but you do, you do want to pay attention to the fact that you can get out ahead too far. Uh, this is a very complicated subject, I mean, because businesses use this as an excuse to resist environmental you know, regulation. So Europe is out ahead in most environmental dimensions of North America, for sure. And, but then you get pushback, and some of it's right. They say, look, you get us too far out ahead and we'll start to lose in this competitive world we live in. And, um, and, and yet the Europeans have managed to get somewhat out ahead without apparently having destroyed their economies. So it's a complicated issue. I want to thank um, Matthew for coming and spending an hour with us, and I want to thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody.